Good evening and uh, welcome to the CPP Foundation Day Lecture. We are privileged to have Ms. Nuran Pandey with us. Uh, she does not need an elaborate uh, introduction, but nevertheless, let me do the uh, uh, introductions. Nuran Pandey uh, has qualifications in literature, uh, art, architecture and music. Uh, she has had a formal qualification in all these uh, areas. She's been uh, the group editor of uh, Hindustan Times, the entire Hindi publications. She was the first woman uh, to occupy that position. Uh, she's written, she's a bilingual writer, writing in English as well as in Hindi. She has multiple books of stories, uh, essays, uh, literary criticism, and even novels. Uh, she's got the Padmashri Award, the Reading Award, and also the Press Council uh, Award uh, for her contribution to um, press. She has also been the uh, editorial advisor to NDTV uh, as well as the chairperson of Prasar Bharti. And she will talk about unseen bipolarities at the heart of uh, the media policies. Uh, thanks a lot, Naranji, for agreeing to come. Uh, we apologize for a little bit of delay, which was because of some technical glitches, but uh, we are ready to go. Thanks a lot, Naranji. Uh, Over to you. Thank you, Shridang. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me over. I'm very grateful to IIMB for inviting me over for this prestigious lecture. And I'm sorry for the technical glitches. Uh, this actually, the lecture is also ironically dealing with some of these issues that cropped up during my talk. Uh, the title, as you know, is Unseen Bipolarity at the Heart of Our Media Policies. Um, policy creation is to Indian media what I feel sexuality to is to women, that which is most one's own, but which is most expropriated by others for molding and reshaping. So uh, in a way, people who are molding and reshaping media policies, like people who mold and reshape the image of the ideal woman constantly are mostly unaware of women's own epistemological stance, the, their own point of view, the point from where they stand in the field. The same with the media people also. The lived reality that we live is seldom experienced by the policymakers at the apex bodies, much less by those who implement them. And I'll explain them. Uh, by and by. So uh, the targets, we become a target instead of being the material of the media policies. And the target so far has experienced such efforts, uh, releasing a spurious idea of freedom of expression. And at the ground level where we work, oppression and unaccountable censorship often continue despite policies to the contrary. I will first start with my experience with India's public sector uh, media. I have divided it into two parts, the paper. My experience with India's public broadcaster Prasar Bharti was shaped during two time segments. First at the cusp of the old century and the new one when I worked as senior editorial advisor of Hindi news on DD. Then a decade later, when I was appointed the chair of Prasar Bharti between 2010 and 2014. My stint with the private print and visual media was far longer, but I'll come to that later. India's public broadcasting sector controls both Doordarshan and All India Radio. Up until 1997, both these entities were departments under the direct control of the Ministry of INP. In 1982, the P.C. Joshi Committee report reiterated that an umbrella corporation should be created which would be run not by the ministry, but by an autonomous board, like the railway board. It would be manned entirely by professionals. The Prasar Bharti Act received presidential approval in 1990 with the stated aim to provide autonomy to broadcasting in India it became an act only in 1997. The main aims as stated in the act are traceable to section 12, which are 
that broadcasting will be construed as public service and two, it will gather and disseminate news, not propaganda for the government to be consumed by the public. Now with these two sections, a peculiar catch 22 like situation arose. Catch-22, those of you who have read Joseph Heller's bestseller, which came out in the 60s, is something that he coined to express the intricacies of bureaucratic thinking, whereby if an airman didn't want to be sent on um, air mission uh, on grounds that he feared for his life, was not deemed crazy. But if he pled that he was crazy and therefore he should not be permitted to fly, then catch 20 arose in which he was told that if he feared for his life, then he was sane because a sane human being alone thinks for his life and therefore he must fly. So the catch 22 arose here. If ever there was a case for creating an arena which stood over fault lines, it was Prasar Bharti. As one of the recent CEOs insisted, Prasar Bharti was never deemed a corporation in the sense of the Companies Act defining the term. It was merely, I quote, a statutory autonomous body whose staff was on deputation from the ministry that paid most of the salaries, but would not pay the operational costs for Prasar Bharti's uh, entities. So the Prasar Bharti was expected to generate revenues for itself by commercial advertising and sponsorship. And the directors general uh, who were usually selected by the ministry continued to be senior bureaucrats, serving bureaucrats. In 1998, some of the delegated powers were restored to the board, but unfortunately the, the, the first the uh, chairperson of Prasar Bharti, Nikhil Chakraborty, died suddenly, and for a long time the post was vacant. So in 2002, the powers were taken back by the ministry. Since then, the board has remained a largely toothless body where the ministry has sanctioned posts of the chairman, two full time members, members, finance, and personnel, and the rest of the people who came to Doordarshan and All India Radio continued to be government servants and reported to the ministry. So as you can see, clashes were frequent, most empowered committees were in dispute and made case for ministry's intervention stronger. A parliamentary standing committee report in 2018 says that the net income of Prasar Bharti in the last three years has halved due to reduced media spending and pro bono campaigns it has run for the government. Thus, Prasar Bharti is where the volatile society of planners with its aura of high learning and information dissemination uh, is like a volatile modern force coming in clash with the implacable force of nature, our Babudam. And then the policies begin to fumble and stumble. The question of autonomy for India's largest public sector media body could not be done due to various disparities. And the, dispar the basic disparity, the basic fault line was between the ministry and the board, which still continues. And because of this, disparities of caste, class, gender in HR were never addressed. And four reports later, the stance of the internal experts is mostly not acceptable to the ministry because it might change the internal dependability of the board on the ministry. So internal policy making, setting up protocols, monetizing the given assets to benefit the area of public broadcasting by investing in best tech and human resources, all these tasks have been with the Information Broadcast Ministry from 1997 up till now. The 2014 report of the Petroda Committee had recognized this schism at the heart of this policy and recommended measures for bringing Prasar Bharti at least on par with BBC 
underscoring an urgent audit of long existing manpower issued. The new government was in saddle and it handed the task to Ernst and Young. They found that the HR structure of Prasar Bharti was rather alarmingly lopsided and the proportion of engineering staff to content creators was exactly reverse of that of BBC. Because, why? Because the promised recruitment board in Prasar Bharti is yet to be established. And for the time being, according to the latest reports, the matter has been kept in abeyance. That's bureaucraties for you, hanging fire till kingdom come. The rich assets that it has by way of huge studios and uh, living accommodations and uh, LPT transmitters in every state in India, it's second to only railways in owning these assets. Plus it has a priceless cache of recordings, both audio and video recordings, which it can monetize, but these have not yet been transferred as per the promises made in the basic policy rules. And therefore there is a clash. I'll see it as a kind of a clash between uh, two power groups, the Brahminical and the Baniya groups. According to the Brahminical group, what is Vidya or what is knowledge for? Jnanaya, Danaya, Chirakshanaya. To impart to others, to give away to others and to protect the weak. That is the ideal of Prasar Bharati. But then comes in the Banya when the ministry <laughs> tells you that you cannot, you cannot ask the ministry for running costs for your operations and you must generate it by advertising and by sponsorship. So this is the other ethos, even if you let go of a particle, where do you get the money from? So this is evidence of the acute bipolarity in the soul of our media policy makers. And I noticed this also in the private sector of that later. Over the years in the name of restructuring, there has been a mountain of data available. There were four major reports, the Vergis Committee Report, the PC Joshi Committee Report, the Shon Sen Committee Report, and the latest last being Petroda Committee Report. And countless brainstormings, countless inputs from some of the best scholars in India, but no vital inputs from the Prasar Bharati board and its actual functionaries who were expected to be handling it all. And a near total lack of understanding of the volatility of news flow an ever-changing new tech because Prasar Bharti pulled in one direction by the board, pulled in another direction by the ministry is like Kalidasa's Parvati na yayau na tastho. She couldn't stay back, but she couldn't leave either. So there is senior bureaucrats are used to giving orders to the ruling board. Tensions between ministries have further reduced Prasar Bharti to a hapless body because they have to report in some cases to as many as five different ministries when organizing special events. And the news teams are still uh, uh, reporting to the uh, ministry because they are employees of the ministry. The 2015-16 report of the Standing Committee criticized the casual government approach to the in entity and pointed out a lack coordination. It once again emphasized, and this was a government standing committee. It told the government that the board needed to be ensured functional autonomy. But in 2018, two years later, the then chairman was quoted that the board was being treated with utter contempt by the ministry so much so that in 2017 and 18, they had to meet their running expenses by digging into the contingency fund of Prasar Bharati. Two years ago, there were several reports that the stand-in CEO of Prasar Bharati had declined a BBC invite. The reason cited in media reports was the adverse coverage BBC had given to Delhi riots. Given the adverse international ratings India has been getting of late, especially since March 
2021 uh, Freedom House Index report. Now the government has floated a draft EOI to create a detailed project report for establishing DD International. And surprise, surprise, the model is DBC again. DD and AIR are still capable of becoming creative public service broadcasting assets. Don't forget that in the 80s and 90s, they came up with brilliant debates, musical broadcasts, TV serials, which were watched by the entire country. More recently, during the tsunami and various cyclones, landslides in the Himalayan region, the All India Radio has played a seminal role. It still has some of the best news editors and the best style sheets prepared very painstakingly by groups of professionals. But the dependency level on ministry's approval causes inordinate delays and broadcast bodies being saddled with a lot of paperwork and near obsolete equipment. During the earthquake, I'll just give you one example here. During the earthquake in Bhuj, which was I think in 2001, the DD cameraman was the first on the spot with his camera and sent us the footage by nine o'clock in the morning. But the footage could not be released until the ministry had uh, given it a green signal. And the ministry could not be approached because all the officials who were empowered to give the green signal were at the parade. So our content, though it was first on the block, could only be aired at three in the afternoon, by which time the private channels had run with the news. To date, because the assets have not been handed over as promised in 1997, Prasad Bharti has accumulated vast but dysfunctional studios in each state capital. It has a heritage building in the Central All India Radio Building on Janpat in uh, New Delhi, which if it could be remodeled, could be a model for excellent architecture. But the nod, the board had approved, but the nod must come from the ministry, which is yet to come. So the board cannot lease or rent out. It cannot use the countless LPT transmitters and junked up obsolete machines to be sold as trash because it has been told that which it does not own, it cannot trash. So this is another catch-22 situation. One must be crazy to fly a mission, but applying for not flying shows that you are not crazy because you are concerned about your well-being. Now we come to the private sector. In a recent interview, Tata Sun's chairman, Mr. Chandrasekharan, was bang on when he said that digital India is globally a very important market, likely to be the fastest growing major media economy. But the size of the market or similarity of technology does not automatically create a uniformly similar global media and well-informed consumers with homogeneous tastes for news and entertainment. The new media ecology in any country, including ours, now presents us with major challenges. The first is, of course, the challenge of ever-changing new technology, new devices, new platforms emerging, and the mega giants from the Silicon Valley. And yet they must coexist with socio-political structure of a hierarchical society and bureaucracy and various institutions of state and a legal legacy media, which is increasingly becoming controlled and funded by a few cash rich political parties, families and major corporate houses. Each of them now have multiple political business interests that they wish to nurse through media empires that they control. So this has been there since the beginning. People started a newspaper uh, primarily during the Freedom Days to tell the people about the Swaraj movement and broadcast Gandhi's speeches and broadcast speeches by other leaders. But later on, it became a vehicle for mouthing government's own interests. And uh, in the private uh, industry also, a similar thing happened. Papers like Pratap and 
Navjagran and Nai Dunya all started with very good intentions, but gradually they have been controlled and acquired by major newspaper chains. And now they are all uh, public corporations and they have shareholders and their corporate houses have their own policies, their own managers who decide over the heads of the editors what is to be done, what route is to be taken. So the multiple political and business interests are being nursed through the various large media empires in India. And sadly, even though India's currency carries the denomination in 18 different Indian languages, within our mainstream media and the Indian society, all power groups, even those who claim to be secular and liberal and equal opportunity employers, remain largely Anglo-centric and impervious of the 90% India that is looking up to their vernacular products. Their newsrooms, their platforms, and the boards remain largely skewed against women, Dalits, and vernaculars. A year before last general elections in 2018, uh, when there was a big proliferation of smartphones in India, the Election Commission of India set up a special committee to initiate a multi-stakeholder engagement process to take stock of the critical gaps in the extant section of the Representation of People Act. The Representation of People's Act is what controls the media, among other things, during the process after the elections are announced until the results are before the people. So that this special committee by the government was to examine the challenges in its implementation and suggest suitable measures to plug in gaps, very noble intentions. Three major areas were identified by the committee where violations were possible. These were one, live TV coverage of political rallies and speeches during the mandatory silent period of 48 hours prior to voting. Two, systematic and organized use of social media platforms to manipulate and deceive and undermine electoral verdicts. And three, the fact that 1996 amendments applied only to electronic media, which is television, cinematograph, or similar apparatus, not to print nor to the digital electronic media, which was by now very, very strong. Now we began to hear the word intermediary liability a great deal. Intermediary liability is a legal concept. It basically governs the responsibility of all online platforms for user generated content. So long as an intermediary informs the users that they are not supposed to post illegal and harmful content, and agrees with the government to take down any content within 36 hours of receiving a report against it, the intermediaries cannot be held responsible or accountable for the news that crops up or news item or items that crop up on their platform. On the eve of 2019 elections, the representatives of the intermediaries were very important people. They met the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and submitted that they were only providers of content to be uploaded by print or electronic media. They remained governed by the Information Technology Act, but not Section 126 that governed the print media and television. The IT Act provided them immunity on condition that they issued rules and regulations for their users about not posting toxic content. In view of that, the representatives of intermediary companies said, in view of that, the election commission would be better serviced by issuing advisories to political parties and candidates. Ultimately, the report concurred and the Babu suggested a voluntary code of ethics for the intermediaries. And we know that the social media was in full form in during all through during the 2019 general elections. Interestingly, at the same time, 
in political party submissions for the much needed reforms in regulatory laws, four subjects were found regular mention. First, the phenomena of paid news, which is news which has been paid for, but which is fielded as uh, editorial matter. Two, the threats posed by fake news and fake videos. And three, the pervasive campaigning via the social media apps. And four, continued TV telecasts featuring interviews with political leaders during the mandatory silent 48 hour period. So you don't really be beep for a, a political party, but you interview their major leaders on television at prime time and allow them to have their say before the public. And they come out all smelling of roses. As the consumption of digitized online news jumped uh, almost by uh, from 0 0.8 gigabytes per person per month to 8 gigabytes in 2018, print's share in total media revenue has begun declining. Once upon a time, it used to be 30% of the total media revenue. Now it's only 18%. This has given a huge uptick to online media. And in this term, this overtakes government's own vital need for objective and verified information because the social media is so quick and so viral so soon that very often government needs objective and verified information and reestablish its credibility. The media needs to establish its credibility with the public and the government. And this has become increasingly difficult. So the question arises, is connectivity equal to fulfilling the democratically promised constitution? And what happens if core competencies of the multimedia industry in vernaculars are still largely situated within and linked to the mainstream print media outfits and their official vehicles? These are complex questions, which most of the policymakers uh, have so far not addressed with any degree of uh, finesse. In 2022, this is this year, Twitter, the Silicon Valley giant, has challenged centers take down orders to flag issues of free expression and future of digital media in India. Twitter has as you, you all know, become a very controversial site of late because of tweets by all kinds of people, individuals as well as political representatives. And because of that, government gave it an order to offload massive amounts of content. And Twitter has now taken the matter to court. And it will be interesting to see what the courts rule. Media are and the government are now both waking up to the fact that web is a complex thing. It is a series of paths and pipes for raw data. It may have been initially designated, designed to be objective and drive the consumers towards verified and truthful news as opposed to bogus, but the business models are largely ad-driven. And the largest driver of a news item is gossip. So the quality of intermediary liability has now acquired a very different color and an urgency which wasn't there in 2019. Globally, a huge fragmentation of media is happening the world over. It is dissolving the motor of society and free speech. For example, Facebook is today more and more like a nation state in itself. It sells as an outlet for free expression like Insta and Google, Amazon and YouTube. It has handed each citizen of the Facebook land the freedom to hit out at the system or praise the system. And all this is challenging news as we knew it once upon a time, which was gathered and checked by professionals and led to interesting democratic debates. As big newspapers cannibalize small ones, a big media giants by smaller platforms, the model for legacy media 
is gut the staff, sell your real estate, jack up subscription prices, and wring out as much cash as is possible. Not the healthiest of options, as you can see. So this is not a story about tribal loyalties or global warlords overtaking democratic fair play. It is about the invisible fault lines within media. It is also about the cynical colonial mindset of our bureaucracy, which is quite happy to slap, slam down on the media when it perceives it to be a threat. Internal dissent and whistleblowing are now become a very dangerous occupations and often being hit out at by ironically a law which was framed by the British against the natives rebelling against them in 1860, which has since been sharpened. And this was the same law which put Gandhi in jail and closed down all his papers, which is now being used, though there are a lot of voices protesting against this law and asking that obsolete laws like this should be set. So there has been a kind of a weaponization of the Indian penal code for policing the media and dissent voices, opposition's self-righteous posturing. Nobody is disagreeing. All political parties, all leaders, and even to a large extent, the public is also baying for the blood of the media without realizing the kind of fault lines that lie below the media, which keep it constantly worried about its existence when the next big one comes. So Twitter takes the government to court, Silicon Valley giants, they trade in data, sustain their com commercial operation, issue their own transparency models. We all know this. But in this, how do we protect the integrity of our platforms and the arrogant defiance of a few individuals? In early July, Internet and Mobile Association and Dialogue, which is an NGO, reacted sharply to a paper about the proposed tweaking of the much maligned IT rules and making intermediary media individually liable for all the content that they uploaded. For, a, for media at this point, the draft as it reads is rather unsustainable because it will create an entry ban for small vulnerable new players, create technically infeasible demands for expunging objectionable content as per the interpreters, and a fear of legal reply, reprisals enforced by an aggressive law enforcement agency. The state demands instant access to mobiles, laptops, and data, even though there are laws about presenting the person or the persons or the entity targeted with some kind of a letter authorizing them to do so. so whether or not it is legal before a person realizes on his mobile, personal mobile, his laptops and data, they are all overtaken and handled, are being handled by law enforcement agencies. This gets multiplied by the fact that the government has not yet put in place implementable SOPs, standard operating procedure for either the media or the enforcement agencies. Yes, now the government is talking of putting in place a grievance appellate committee to which an appeal can be made by intermediaries who are now going to be liable for the content that they upload. But the intermediaries now feel that the central government body, the GAC or the grievance appellate committee Will it give the right of hearing to them or just swoop down on them and shut them down? Two, will this committee even write or publish its orders? Usually they are verbal, communicated directly, and no written record is available uh, to the public. So intermediaries feel that they should have the right to be heard 
by the grievance committee, which incidentally is going to be formed by the government and understandably will be peopled with people representing the government. And nobody is sure whether it will like a regular court of law write and publish its orders. <clears throat> the Honorable Chief Justice has recently said that judiciary is answerable only to the constitution. Another judge, Justice Padiwala, is also right that the social media needs new policies to be controlled. But it is not so easy. All this is moving towards crowdsourcing censorship. Is this the right course of action at this point? The USA is showing if politics turns polarized, the judiciary's role as guardian of people's rights begins to get affected as well. Let's accept that the media today has also become both a social and political institution with legal rights issues. So we need to recognize, we need to dive into the wreck, into the geological wreck that the media is today. When geologists try to explain a big earthquake, they first go deep into the earth to see what fault lines have moved and what kind of energy they have released to bring down the structures on top. So we must recognize a few things. One, recognize the core issue is freedom of speech, which has been guaranteed by our secular constitution. And the realistic conditions in which media, especially the vernacular media functions today, often run contrary to it. These have created conditions by which journalists are abused regularly by the police citing a legally validated policy interpretation. After months of harassment and incarceration, if the honorable court disagrees with, they are released, but they have had their fear psychosis embedded. And two, we should recognize that despite all claims as women experience it, the state and its law enforcement agencies wear a male face when handling the media trolls. Even on the social media, the same forms of male power and abuse that deny freedom of speech to, within, to women within homes and in the marketplaces and publicly shame them for dissent, the same faces are seen not just in trolls, but often in party spokesperson as well. No law gives state or the media corporation the right to violate citizens' privacy and freedom of speech. But this is not necessary because we are yet to accept that the state and the media giants have a disproportionate sense of entitlement and access to data based on the lives of its, their consumers and voters and they may use it to their advantage to oblige and or monetize. On occasion, various political parties have themselves been known to access vital data using both coercion and authority. Three, we must recognize that de jure, our law outlaws any muzzling of the right to freedom of expression under Article 19A, but de facto, it is permitting the state to cherry pick whistleblowers and fake news busters. Bail is no longer an exception, but the rule. Will we see a digital Geneva Convention for world media in our lifetime, I wonder. One of the wisest recorders of history of mankind, Herodotus, had no access to mobiles or global media, but he managed excellently to engage emotionally and cognitively with the world as he saw it during his long travels. He was the first to report on the long wars. He talks of his ideal fighter, an Athenian called Sophanes, who carried a heavy iron anchor into battle attached to his breastplate with a bronze chain. When he spotted the enemy, he dropped the anchor and invited a head-on collision. If the enemy turned and fled, it was his plan to pick up the anchor and go after them. This rather rambling lecture is aimed at recapturing that lovely metaphor. So Fanny's promoting a sense of curiosity about the world around us while standing upright against those that challenge his freedom. This is the best we can do at the moment. Thank you very much for listening in. And I hope 
I have been able to un, un, unravel some of the complex issues for you uh, without getting into too much nitty gritty. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Anna. This was a wonderful lecture. I mean, you've covered a very wide uh, spectrum in such a short time. I mean, uh, if, if uh, you know, one of my colleagues uh, just messaged me saying that this is very nuanced in such few sentences. Uh, and uh, the bit that you've covered is amazing. I was just trying to note down uh, the inputs that we got. I mean, you've covered private media versus private, uh, public media. You've co covered the thought leadership versus the trade of it. You've covered legacy media versus new media. You've covered policy and law. And you've also covered some gender issues. Uh, even though it looked in the passing, it was significant gender issues. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, this uh, wonderful uh, talk. Uh, let me start by kicking off uh, uh, my question before we get to other questions. Uh, is there, uh, I mean, there are two parts of it. You know, you talked about the BBC model uh, for the TV international that they're talking about. What is that model? Does it legally ensure autonomy or is it autonomy by practice? Uh, that's one, one question. Uh, actually, there are no models, unfortunately because the media has changed so much so swiftly within the last five years. And its footprint is now so huge. And with the easy translation facilities available, uh, you can tweet or you can write or you can broadcast in any language and it will go viral. And as you know, non-resident Indians are spread out all over the world and very often cases are being lodged or questions are being lodged on the basis of cases are being lodged against the media. So I feel that the law really has to be reimagined here. You know, the basis, as I said, should be the freedom of expression. That should be sustained. Like uh, Sophonis' <laughs> anchor, the, the, the sheer obduracy of professionals in the media must be helped, sustained, and protected instead of being chipped away. And it's for the legal community to really also do a soul search on the whole area, because eventually if there is the freedom of expression is suppressed or affected in a negative way, then it will eventually come to haunt everyone. Look at Sri Lanka, what is happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, several of my Sri Lankan journalist friends were very badly affected by the regime in power. The regime did not realize how deep the anger of the public ran and look at it burning today. So I appeal both to the legal community and the executive to look at these questions seriously, not just as political issues, but as socio-political human rights issues. I had one more small question. I mean, is there a difference between freedom of expression that we use in general and freedom of journalistic expression? Is there a nuance there? Uh, because I don't uh, what you uh, give to general public, but uh, a trained journalist has to broadcast something, and that's you know that's much more nuanced than just freedom of expression. I wanted to ask. Ironically, we don't have a separate act guarding the media's freedom of expression as they have in the US. The same Article 19A of the Constitution guarantees freedom of speech to both the media and the general public. Uh, so the citizens and the media come under the same uh, legal provision. The media has uh, expertise, the media has access to platforms, the media has access to news on ground, how they use it, if they use it responsibly, if they use it objectively and scientifically, I think they do a lot of good to everybody, including the society. But the society itself, the newcomers, you know, like a friend of mine said in Hindi, ki social media has given a kind of a razor in the hands of a monkey. You know, individuals in society who were you know, it first started with citizens, uh, citizen journalists. And I was somewhat alarmed as an old style journalist 
that you know news has to be filtered, cross checked, and double checked, and that kind of a possibility is there in the legacy media still, even though the newsrooms have shrunken and the bureaus have mostly gone out. Still, there are desks which can check, recheck, and be held answerable and accountable. So accountability is a big thing, but at the same time. We find that what is happening is increasingly political scores are being set, settled under this clause. And people are saying, no, such and such a group or such and such a person does not deserve to be enjoy this freedom. There I disagree. I'm with Sophonis. You know, I have thrown down my anchor and I stand there. And I say, all right, tell us where we have gone wrong. If you can prove it legally, in a court of law, as per the law of the land, no midnight swoops, no midnight knocks on the door. Go through the proper legal route and don't weaponize the IPC. If you make, uh, you know, defamation a criminal rather than a civil matter, and then you lodge cases in 15 different states, you know, you're really harassing somebody who's in the business of gathering news and who's answerable to the product. So it is a very complex field. I would not say that I hold the brief for either the media or the legal community, but I do think that both the legal community and the governments who frame governmental policies, the state policies, need to really rethink. And this harassment by the police, this constant fear of you know being hounded out of field uh, has to be tackled. I, uh, I request my colleagues to put their hand up if they want to ask a question. I'll continue with one more. Um, I'm being a little selfish. Uh, see, I largely work broadly in the banking arena. And therefore, my question is, when, when the Reserve Act of India gives a license to a bank, it is done very carefully and it is de I mean, largely demutualized. I mean, they put out a, a circular, I mean, a draft guideline saying that should it not be demutualized. But basically, large industrial houses do not get banking licenses because they will lend to themselves. I mean, that's, that's a fear. Uh, would something of that sort, it says that media houses should be pure media houses with no relation to other business houses, would that sort of an ownership structure work? Uh, would the economics also sort of uh, define that sort of work? I mean, is it possible at all? That's just a thought that I'd like to leave. Uh, the, <clears throat> I feel that there should be a broad-based consultation. And the stakeholders, people who are actually working on the ground and handling the media as it is today, and handling the technology which the media is using, they should be at least 50% of that group. The rest of them can be governed representatives, civil society people, such as it is, and representatives of major political parties. But 50% of the people should be people who are working on the ground. Because what is happening is, just like Manrega and countless other Ujwala and other Yojanas, all these policies are consulted to benefit women but women are never on the bodies. Even when they are being discussed on television, the farmers' rights, for example, 50% of the work in the farming sector is done by women. But when farming laws are being framed or challenged or they are being discussed on television, you know, you find manals all over. The women are just absent by their, you know, if they're, they're there in images, it is as a soft story, you know, Haryana women with their heads covered, riding tractors and waving flags. And that's taken as a very cute gesture. The hard work and the knowledge that they hold within remains unrealized by the state. So I think we should become inclusive. We are becoming more and more exclusive. You know, uh, as, as I said, you know, the area of knowledge has in India has always been controlled by the Brahmins, if not the Brahminical ethos. And therefore, it has remained a precinct which feeds patriarchy, which also feeds certain caste interests. And therefore, if you go through and analyze the, the proportion of caste-wise readers and match it against the newsrooms, you will find 
that in actual newsrooms or in the actual policy rooms and especially in the boardrooms of major legacy media, they are absent. And so I think we have to really think of inclusivity because women are now participating much more in digital media because working from home has become a good option for them. And uh, they are vigilant, they are keeping up uh, with the times and a lot of them are doing very, very fine work and risking their lives even during the COVID, they risk their lives. But when media policies are being discussed, when Grimans redressal read committees are made, you find that they're an all government body. And therefore, our side remains unspoken, not just women, women, Dalits, especially the vernacular media, the various Indian languages, where are they being represented in which body? So I think that needs to be re-looked at. We have, not, we have to actually rethink the whole state through the eyes of these groups, which are in the majority, but which have been denied the freedom of expression. We don't need a law for that. Tradition denies them that. Tradition denies women the knowledge of uh, Sanskrit. It denies the knowledge of Sanskrit to Shudras also. In Sanskrit plays, you find only the king speaks Sanskrit and his courtier speaks Sanskrit. Only the queen among women speaks Sanskrit. The rest of the women speak Prakrit. So there you have knowledge is a great divider and denier of opportunities in India. And I think we have to address this painful issue of gender, of language, and of caste. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my colleague Arpit uh, has a question, so I ask him to come up. Hi, Munarji. Thank you for the great lecture. Uh, I had a question about the intermediary liability. Right. Uh, so, you know, I mean, Facebook and Twitter may say that they are not legally liable for hate speech or toxic content. Uh, but it's clear that, and as you also pointed out, you know, uh, gossip and toxic content drives engagement, which drives their ad revenue. So there's a clear, you know, they benefit from toxic content, but they don't want to be legally liable for it. But flip side is that, you know, if there are millions of such posts every day, you know, can they be, uh, is it feasible to hold them liable in, uh, for such content? Well, I think uh, some, kind of liability, some kind of liability must be attached. But where I agree with them is that the government should not insist on throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mass content uh, you know, removal is something which is very difficult. And it's also accept the fact that technologically, it is something which has to be done by technically very, very smart and well clued in people. It cannot be like the print media, this headline will not go. It's no longer like that. If you the content has been uploaded and has gone viral, then to take it down proportionately is a very, very difficult and a very refined job. It has to be done. It cannot be done by a Thanedar level uh, government functionary. So the government also has to develop the skills within. If, if, it, if it only uses strong arm methods, then it will be killing news. And therefore, I think the government has to develop in uh, cooperation with these very agencies, a kind of a mechanism through which it is possible to swiftly spot, prove the legal liability, and then have it removed. Uh, one question, I mean, uh, looking back when you were working with HC and you had a long innings there, uh, what sort of an edit editorial independence did you have? And do you think uh, the perception now is that editorial independence is much lesser or is it no different? Shiram, there's a lot of echoing in for some reason in your chamber. The other voices I hear clearly. Can you re-ask the question? I couldn't hear it very clearly. There's a lot of echo. Uh, okay. Uh, let me... No, uh, the question that I was asking is, am I clear now? Yes, relatively. Yeah. So the question that I was asking was, uh, uh, looking back at your innings with HC in the HC group as a group editor, uh, was there better editorial freedom during those days compared to the perceived editorial freedom now? Uh, have the times changed and what was the economic model that was driving it then? And has the economic model changed or is it the political model that is uh, driving the independence of the Look, it would be very easy and also very dishonest 
if i said no no hamare waqt mein sab acha tha we were all very good we were super humans and we were very much more dedicated than people are now that's not true we we, we still have very good journalists today the thing is that the technology has changed the number of consumers has grown exponentially and the temperament of the new consumer is such that he or she is mobile so most of them watch their news on the mobile earlier it was a broadsheet from a broadsheet to a mobile from an 1800 word story you have to limit your story to 400 words at the most to be uploaded quickly and be consumed by people with appropriate visuals so you know for that you have to master technology so what has happened in newsrooms is that on the one hand are the oldies who have the knowledge the know how and the you know instant instinctive understanding of news this story is important this story is not this is a plant this is not a plant but on the other hand is the technologically charged bunch of young kids who are running the portals they are in no mood to really be very swiftly reviewed and very often the mistakes that occur are due to the you know generational false lines within the media so i think all these things have to be addressed in india we kind of a make four or five silver bullets and we fire them and we think that this will kill the uh, whatever flaw there is it doesn't happen like that and even in our days in the uh, first decade of this century there were signs of change because paid news was already a phenomena the late prabhash joshi who was a fellow editor and a very dear friend led a whole bunch of uh, media representatives to protest against this trend but uh, now nobody even talks about paid news because it is assumed that news must be paid for and the early people who latched on to news and the portals are used to getting their news for free from aggregators so they are not terribly keen on subscribing to firewalled newspapers so that is something new that the newspapers and their ownership has to contend with and at the same time there is another fault line which is very worrisome and it is that news needs to be collected <coughs> curated and verified and double checked before being served to the general public or before being um, uploaded but there is very little time in 24/7 portals uh, so i think the law also has to take note of this you know supposing something happens and the first news that your representative files says that somebody has died so the desk then quickly uploads it every desk uploads it five about an hour later the police version arrives on the desk it says nobody was killed so then usual process is to download to remove that earlier news item and upload the police verified document which is duly done now i notice a worrisome trend that even matter which has been downloaded um even matter which has been removed is being reused matter posted 3 years ago is being reused for targeting certain individuals or papers or certain portals and that is worrisome and it is also uh, legally and morally incorrect um in one case a uh, post which dated back to i think 2018 is being used to uh, was initially used to jail a journalist though according to law the section under which he was jailed also specifies that after if this incident is not reported for 2 years then uh, the liability is gone and so a 3 year old post does not meet the qualification but to cover that up several other clauses are hunted out and certain other feeds which had been uploaded by that person or persons are taken out of the waste paper basket and used to nail that person down 
And these are becoming possible because of the technology and also because everything has become politicized and weaponized in a way that we couldn't imagine then. So yes, this is new. I live each day and learn uh, what new can happen in the media. And it's worrisome. One last question from my side. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the, in the earlier days, I mean, I'm also uh, uh, feeling very old as I'm talking this uh, to you. But, uh, you know, it was very clear that uh, if you looked at the newspaper, you'd know what is a tabloid and what is a gossip mongering newspaper versus what is a serious newspaper. And we used to make that distinction and, you know, tabloids and gossip also coexisted with serious news. Uh, with uh, paid news, uh, not paid, paid for by the uh, uh, newsmaker, but paid for by the subscriber, the alternative paid news model, which, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, print as well as uh, digital media houses are having uh, and putting their content behind a paywall. Is that distinction now becoming a little sharper? And do you think if this sort of emerges in uh, somebody looking for credibility would possibly go on to a paywall sort of a, a, this thing and uh, um, make, make that, you know, larger distinction in, uh, in, in the perception. Is that uh, something that... See, what has been happening is also that the re media, the revenues, the revenue sources of the media have been shrinking. In the 90s, um, you know, uh, they inflated the cover costs of newspapers and uh, they saw a shrinking base. So one major newspaper chain then reduced the price of its daily fat daily newspaper to one rupee. And overnight, mopped up a lot of subscribers and the number of subscribers then got it outstandingly rich crop of uh, advertising which then cross-subsidized what they had lost in uh, revenues from the sales of the actual newspapers. And this created a very bad model because uh, then every other newspaper followed. So the pricing of the newspaper uh, died out as a revenue gatherer and advertisements became very important. Then early in the century, the advertising pie the bigger chunk began to go to news aggregators and they were mostly Silicon Valley giants. And uh, they shared a portion of their uh, uh, revenues with the portals from which they aggregate the news, but it is minuscule compared to the whopping big amounts that they are gathering. With the result, the print media is now very, very heavily dependent uh, as never before on government advertising. Days were in 80s when DAVP or Department of Audiovisual Publicity Advertising was the poor cousin among advertising uh, areas. And, um, you know, because they're, 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 uh, they offered very little by way of money, but it was prestigious because it came from the government. But today the government has really opened its coffers to the media in direct proportion to important people not talking directly to media and not doing press conferences with the media, uh, their coffers are available to the owners. But uh, we also see uh, that um, a lot of editorials on editorial page used to be sacrosanct where only professionals and experts were invited to write. But today in every language, in every paper, you see editorials written by political heavyweights from various parties. And uh, it's not very difficult to connect the dots. And I think that uh, the media is starved for revenues. And as the Hindi saying goes, um, as the Sanskrit saying rather goes, bhubhukshitam kimna karuti papam, somebody who's hungry may commit any sin. And that's not a very healthy thing to happen to the media. It has firewalled itself, but it is difficult. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for, it's becoming increasingly difficult for smaller vernacular papers 
to survive in this kind of an atmosphere uh, without compromising much. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit. I don't think there are any other questions as of now. Uh, so I think uh, we may end the session here on a not so uh, positive note, uh, which you just uh, gave. But uh, let's uh, try and uh, hope that uh, there are better days uh, for the media as well as for the consumers of media. Uh, thank you very much for taking your time off and uh, coming online. Uh, I wish you had actually come uh, to the campus. I tried my level best to pursue you, but I know that uh, you had your own constraints. Uh, I hope at some point in time we'll uh, get you onto the campus uh, because what, what we miss in an online conversation is the off the record uh, banter that we have over possibly a dinner or a cup of tea. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to that at some point in time whenever things are better for you and you're able to travel. Uh, thank you very much. This was the fourth uh, lecture uh, in the Foundation Day Lecture Series. Uh, we've had uh, very good speakers till now. and. Uh, you enhance the prestige of this series uh, by joining us. Thank you very much.